So it's an exciting workshop agenda, and I am now going to move over to be a moderate, moderator for session one. And I would like to invite the first speaker, who is Rami Ibrahim. Uh, Rami Ibrahim is currently the, uh, the head of, of uh, 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 Develop Parker Institute. He is the chief uh, medical officer. Rami has a distinguished career. Uh, both at Bristol Myers uh, and at AstraZeneca, and has been involved intimately in the development of immunotherapies. And I think his position at the Parker Institute gives him a very interesting lens uh, to sort of to give us his view of the current state of play uh, for immunotherapies and PD-1, pd one combinations in particular. So, Ramey, over to you. All right. Uh, good morning, and uh, thanks, Roger and Samir, for inviting me. Uh, so I think my presentation would be the easiest one because I'm basically repeating what's going to be presented uh, on the agenda over the next day and a half. Um, and um, I think if you are here today, uh, then I think we all believe that immunotherapy uh, has arrived. Um, immunotherapy comes in different shapes and forms, but uh, what's common across all different um, approaches that rely on the uh, immune system to fight cancer that we're seeing that they are durable, they are adaptable, uh, they can be synergistic with other uh, modality, and it actually it induces a systemic um, effect. And again, it doesn't matter which approach we're using. Um, and in, in many cases, actually, it overcomes some of the limitations that we have with surgical reception or radiation, which are very local uh, therapies. So if we start thinking about the current landscape of, uh, of immunotherapy, I think many of you would agree with me that uh, we've made a lot of, uh, of progress uh, and there are so many exciting new agents that are really improving the uh, uh, lives of uh, patients with cancer, uh, but none of them are fully curative and there are still many indications or histologies uh, that immunotherapy hasn't been um, effective in. So I figured I will start with my conclusion, uh, so that in, in anyone who needs to step out and get more coffee. Um, so if you start thinking about what happened with CTLA-4, PD-1, and combinations, uh, with CTLA-4, uh, there is definitely uh, uh, enough evidence right now that uh, there's a long-term benefit uh, for a subset of patients who are treated with anti-CTLA-4 antibody. Um, the patients who develop a clinical benefit, usually those benefits uh, are very durable, uh, we've seen many publications that describe how sometimes with anti-CTLA-4 antibodies, uh, we can get very unique uh, patterns of responses. And even the adverse events associated with uh, CTLA-4 are unique and they are inflammatory um, in nature. Um, and a lot of work has been done uh, to generate guidelines to inform oncologists uh, of how to manage those adverse events. Uh, to my knowledge, there are no uh, biomarker that has been identified uh, for patients who are uh, receiving uh, or might be benefiting from anti-CTLA-4 antibody. To switch to the focus of this meeting or the anti-PD-1 um, antibodies, um, there have been approval based on uh, randomized uh, studies uh, that really show survival benefit uh, over chemotherapy or standard of care um, uh, therapies. Um, there's, again, now very well-established toxicity management guidelines that can inform how best to uh, manage uh, patients who might be experiencing some of those adverse events. Um, and then the, uh, the interesting observation with the anti-PD-1 antibodies um, is that notion of immunotherapy will only work in immunogenic uh, tumor types is no longer the case. Uh, for the longest time, anyone who's developing uh, an immune modulator um, the first indication uh, was always melanoma or, or, or renal cell carcinoma, but now we're seeing activity and indications that we never thought that immunotherapy um, can be effective in. Um, again, the work that the group at Merck did um, where it shows that uh, PD-1 can, can work in, um, uh, in a molecular subtype uh, that's uh, histology independent, uh, I think was one of the uh, great breakthroughs that we've seen in the past uh, couple of years. Uh, the biomarker, we're going to spend a lot of time today uh, and tomorrow talking about the needs for uh, biomarker, but I think based on the data that we have seen so far, uh, pdl one expression can be used uh, for uh, selecting patients in a certain uh, settings. Um, it's unlikely that it's going to be the biomarker that will inform uh, patient selection, um, and most likely we will need a composite uh, biomarker. 
And then we started to see uh, some synergy when PD-1s are being combined with other uh, agents, um, including combination with standard of care um, in certain settings. So if we switch to the combinations, um, Again, over the past two years, uh, there's more data that suggests that uh, instead of, of the approach of trying to um, generate uh, chemo-free regimens and replace chemotherapy with immunotherapy, now we are starting to see data that supports that uh, immunotherapy can be synergistic if it's combined with the right agent in the right setting. Um, we've seen great data with the uh, sequential therapy of the anti pd one antibody following uh, chemo in the, um, in the uh, non-small cell lung cancer. A lot of data now is being generated uh, with the tumor mutational burden as potentially one of the biomarkers to inform uh, the, uh, the, uh, who might benefit from the treatment. Um, and then there's been a lot of work uh, to try to understand the um, PD-1 uh, resistance. Many combinations have been tested now in this setting. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's still early days, but we haven't seen uh, something that's... Um, <laughs> That's very uh, encouraging because we do need to spend a little bit more time trying to understand the biology of PD-1 uh, resistance. And then we're not going to talk uh, about the cellular therapy in this meeting, but obviously we cannot ignore uh, the recent approvals with the CAR-Ts in, uh, in liquid tumors. Um, obviously, it's not ready uh, for prime time in solid tumors, but a lot of work now is being done to try to understand how can we... Uh, benefit from the successes that we have seen in hematological malignancies and try to use cellular therapy uh, in solid tumors. So this is the data that supported the, uh, all the statements that were made about the uh, epilimumab or the anti-CTLA-4 antibody. With 10 years of follow-up in some patients, I think it is clear that a small subset of patients, which in this case only one out of uh, five patients treated with uh, epilimumab, will have this long-term uh, benefit. And then this is some of just the uh, data that supported the uh, approvals of the anti-PD-1 and pd one um, antibodies. And as I mentioned, the early wave of studies were studies that were doing head-to-head -head comparisons uh, against standard of care chemotherapy. And in most cases, those studies were able to demonstrate a survival benefit um, compared to existing uh, therapies. And those were some of the studies that led to the uh, initial approvals of the um, anti-PD-1 and pd one um, antibodies. And if we look at the past uh, six years, um, it, it all started with the anti uh, stla 4 antibody approval in 2011, and now we have different uh, modalities that, that have been approved uh, with a total of, of 10 uh, different agents that have been approved uh, in different indications. Um, and again, the most recent approval was the CAR-Ts uh, as uh, recent as the end of last year. And this table actually is a table now that I'm having a hard time uh, to keep uh, updated. Uh, we're getting new indications and supplemental BLAs uh, almost weekly, which is, again, great for, uh, for patients that now there are more uh, therapies available. Um, but thus, this just really shows uh, some of the um, approvals or the indications. And as you can see here, again, it's, not, it's no longer just the melanoma uh, or the renal cell carcinoma. We are seeing uh, great activities uh, in other indications too. But this led to uh, the very um, uh, difficult or, uh, or challenging uh, environment that we're in right now as uh, scientists and drug developers. So there are five agents or five PD-1s and PD-L1s that have been approved. Uh, but the, uh, the group at the Cancer Research Institute has really been keeping an eye on what's happening in the immunotherapy landscape. And based on their database, uh, yes, we have five agents that are approved. We have 100, more than 160 anti-PD-1 or pd one uh, antibodies that are in development. Many of them are still preclinical, but that means they will be uh, coming to the, clinical, to the clinic soon. But there are 50 anti-PD-1 and pd one um, antibodies that are currently being tested in the clinic. And this graph just shows the different uh, phases in, uh, in development. And when we start thinking about how complex the environment is using the anti-PD-1 and pd one antibodies, what we are seeing with the PD-1 and pd ones is not unique. Uh, if you start looking at all the other modalities uh, that fall under the category of immune, uh, immune therapy, um, there are more than 2,000 uh, agents that's in uh, development, and half of them are already uh, in the clinic. So it's close to 1,000 uh, agents that are currently in the clinic. We have more, around 350 vaccines that are currently being tested in different stages. 
uh, cellular therapy is still in early days, but there are still hundreds of, uh, of uh, cellular therapies that are currently um, in the clinic. So building on the successes that we have seen uh, with the uh, monotherapy, the obvious uh, next steps were to start thinking about how can we build on those successes by using um, combination. And if you start looking at the number of clinical trials uh, that are assessing the uh, combinations, and here we just broke them down by the um, agents that are either approved or about to be approved, uh, and each agent has hundreds of, of clinical trials that are uh, assessing the uh, combination of a PD-1 or PDR one with other modalities. Uh, and as you can see from this summary, um, combining uh, immunotherapies with other immunotherapies uh, is the um, most common approach, but right now there are more work that's being done to try to combine immunotherapy with either targeted therapies or chemotherapy and radiation. Um, and um, many of those studies are starting to generate uh, data. What was interesting um, uh, is that the team at CRI started looking at um, whether we are reaching the plateau. Uh, are we still seeing an increase in the number of clinical trials? So they started comparing the number of studies that were reported, or at least that were in the public domain by the um, end of uh, 2017 to the number of studies that are currently uh, uh, in uh, or uh, posted. And as you can see here, that we have not reached the plateau. We are constantly seeing an increased number of, uh, of clinical trials, um, and there are more than 500 new studies uh, that were uh, launched just from September of 2017 uh, till today. And again, this is just another visual uh, to show that on the uh, left side, those were the studies that they summarized uh, when, they, uh, when they published uh, their data. Uh, there was uh, almost 1,100 uh, combo studies uh, by the end of 2017, and now we're up to a 1,500 uh, studies that are currently uh, in the clinic. And as you can see here, uh, still combining uh, a PD-1 or PDL one with anti-CTLA-4 antibody has a large number of clinical trials, but now there is some shift to start looking at the combination of, uh, of those agents um, with chemotherapy or standard of care. So for many uh, immunologists uh, in the room, um, everyone started thinking that now that we have a better understanding of the um, immune uh, response and how we can actually uh, mount an immune response against cancer. There are many groups that are focusing on trying to understand the uh, different uh, receptors and ligands and, uh, and uh, the downstream effect of, uh, of each one. And the idea was uh, if each receptor or ligand has a different pathway or a different downstream effect, then if we start combining two different immune modulators, then likely uh, we will uh, see some synergy um, in the combination. And the same thing with, uh, with chemotherapy or radiation. Uh, we hear it a lot that uh, if you start combining uh, with destructive therapies, so therapies that will lead to uh, antigen shedding, then this will uh, improve the antigen presentation, and then eventually you're going to end up with priming the immune system. So if you add an immunotherapy to radiation or chemotherapy, you should see uh, synergy. Unfortunately, things are not that simple. Uh, so this is an old study, I think one of the very first studies that looked at this exact hypothesis, that if you combine uh, radiation therapy with an anti ctla 4 antibody in prostate cancer, we should start to see uh, benefit here. Uh, unfortunately, this study did not uh, meet the primary endpoint, although that there's some uh, early signal that uh, maybe the combination uh, is benefiting patients, but the study did not uh, meet the primary endpoint. So it's not just a simple um, uh, approach, which is release antigen, give an immune modulator, then you will see uh, synergy. But then very recently, we've seen data from uh, Durvalumab, which is the anti pd one antibody, uh, when it was given as a sequential therapy uh, for following a chemo radiation uh, for stage three or unresectable stage three uh, non-small cell lung cancer, there is, I think, a clear benefit here. Same thing, we've seen data with PD-1 uh, being combined with chemotherapy in, in the frontline non-small cell lung cancer, and there is a clinical benefit here. So again, it's still not clear, and it's not as simple approach as combined with, with a uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy, um, and likely you will see a, a synergy or a benefit here. And then 
again, given the hundreds of, of clinical trials, it is expected that we're going to start seeing some uh, negative uh, results. Uh, one of the challenges that we're seeing right now is uh, you start seeing an early signal of activity based on the phase one uh, data. Very quickly, you take this into a randomized clinical trial um, and you don't see the same um, effect. So we really need to spend a little bit more time in the phase one uh, trying to understand why agents are working together, what's the mechanism of synergy, and, and how can we come up with a biomarker that can inform the subset of patients who might be benefiting from, uh, from the combination. We hear the criticism all the time that people are complaining that uh, the approach that we're following uh, for combination is really trying to see if anything will stick on the wall, and if it sticks, then we take this into a, a phase three but I think we need to spend a little bit more time trying to make sense of the existing data. Many people are focusing more on what would be the next uh, combination that we should take into the clinic, but there are very few who are spending time to try to understand why certain combinations did not work or why are we seeing an early signal of activity, but then when you take it into a larger uh, clinical trial, you don't see the same, uh, same effect. So we are starting to, uh, to focus on um, trying to uh, learn from the uh, existing data uh, that we have. So it's not about let's start the next smart combination, let's, uh, let's, not, um, uh, let's actually uh, generate data that will inform the uh, next best uh, combo to take into the clinic, but really spending time and resources trying to understand what have we learned from the existing data. So at the Parker Institute, uh, we are spending some of our time really working with the uh, academic centers and trying to look at the data that has been generated uh, from a work that they have done and, and using this data to try to inform uh, a future or a modality or approach uh, that they can use uh, in their clinical uh, trials. I'm not going to go into details, but those are just some uh, examples of, of work that's being done across different um, institutes. So speaking of the uh, nonprofit organization, um, we always, when we start thinking about combinations or immunotherapy development, uh, we always bucket the work into either work that's being done at academic institutes or work that's being done uh, in pharma. But nonprofits can really play uh, an important role here, uh, trying to bridge between pharma or industry and, and the academic um, institutes. Uh, Park Institute is just one example, uh, there are many nonprofit organizations uh, now that are really dedicating, dedicating uh, resources um, to, uh, to support immunotherapy. There are the Cancer Research Institutes, Friends of Cancer Research, uh, among many others. Um, so at Parker, we're working with seven uh, academic centers. Uh, so those are Memorial, uh, uh, Penn, UCSF, UCLA, Stanford, and most recently uh, we've added uh, Dana-Farber. Um, and again, the idea here is that to try to um, facilitate the collaboration uh, within the academic centers, but also collaboration um, externally. So the way that we are trying to, um, to position ourselves is that we are a linker between the work that's being done um, in pharma and uh, the work that's being done at the um, academic uh, institutes. Uh, we try to build some resources that we can make available uh, to our partners, so that includes clinical trial management uh, capabilities that would allow us to run studies using agents coming from different uh, pharma companies or agents that are being developed by some of our academic centers. Um, we've built the bioinformatics and bioanalytical uh, capabilities, uh, because again, I think it's not about starting new studies, uh, but more about learning from uh, existing studies and trying to come up with some SOPs uh, that can be used across different institutes so that we can introduce some standardization and some commonality uh, in the work that's being done regardless of which institute. So again, the idea here is uh, really to follow the science, generate data that would inform uh, future combinations, and then not to be restricted by a pipeline. So some of the limitations uh, that we have uh, is that for many companies, it's easier uh, to start looking at combinations within your own pipeline. That doesn't mean, and again, we've seen the slide that there are hundreds of combinations being done across uh, different pharma uh, groups, but it's usually easier to start combining with agents that you have full control on. So again, when a group like us uh, can do is really see what the science is, is telling us and then go and get the agents from the different companies without companies having to uh, establish a direct uh, partnership. But then it's more about 
being able to analyze the data that's being generated uh, and not just uh, adding to the confusion. And then one of the issues that we have with the um, work that's being done in academic centers, um, and based on the CRI analysis, more than 60% of the combinations are combinations that are being tested as investigator sponsor studies. And in many cases, uh, there is redundancy. In many cases, the same question is being asked by different scientists. Um, they usually have limited resources that they can uh, put toward the, the investigator sponsor studies. So sometimes the data that we see from investigator sponsor studies cannot really inform uh, next steps. So what we are trying to do is instead of scientists working in silos and everyone uh, is, is doing their own very small clinical trial, uh, one of the um, approaches or the solutions that we're trying to uh, propose is to really start bringing the scientists who are interested in a certain area together. And instead of doing those one-off small investigator sponsor studies, now by, by creating those platforms, now each scientist can bring the combination that they are interested in, and then this can be tested uh, in a platform uh, study. Uh, the other area that we're very interested in is the uh, neoadjuvant uh, setting or a window of opportunity. Uh, we feel that uh, this is a, uh, an area where we can generate a lot of mechanistic uh, data that can inform how best uh, to combine uh, different agents. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on is the importance of uh, developing and supporting uh, new technologies. Uh, we really need to provide scientists with new tools uh, that can help them uh, better understand the data uh, or the combination. This is just one example of the companies that we're working with. Uh, it's a company that developed a CD8 uh, probe. So the idea here is that if you can see an immune response on a scan, then in the future you might not need to stick a needle in a patient every time you want to answer the question of did my combination induce an immune response in this patient or not. So this is just an example of, uh, of one of the tools that, again, there are lots of limitations because you're just looking at CD8, so this will not be the answer to it. Uh, but developing new technologies like this, uh, especially if we use them in phase one studies uh, when we are looking at serial biopsies, really seeing this uh, influx of CD8 in the tumor can be an early sign that a certain combination uh, might be um, effective. Thank you.